I want to tell you the story of a physician who is the first to make music with a garden that never grows, a sculptor who convinced stones to sing, a modern mystery of geology tucked away in the rural forests of Pennsylvania, and a study in erosion, a notion that we may never be able to get back that by which our own hand is lost forever. Oh, and somewhere along the way, pun definitely intended, we're going to make some rock music. Erosion from the French erosion, which is from the Latin erosio, to gnaw away or consume. A couple miles off the water on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River, about 60 miles north of Philadelphia, you'll find Ringing Rocks Park, a field of sonorous rocks that when struck with a hammer produce a resonant, sustained tone with a discernible pitch. Sometimes referred to as stony gardens, these fields are a favorite spot to many locals, but it's not just a local phenomenon. In addition to the three prominent sites you have here in Pennsylvania, we have similar sites across the world, like Cerro de las Campanas, the Hill of Bells in Mexico, Bell Rock Range in Western Australia, and the infamous Ringing Rocks of Montana. In 1880, a physician and part-time musician, John J. Ott, or as his friends would call him, JJ, gave a performance here at the Ringing Rocks for the Buck Wampum Historical Society. You could even say that it was the first ever rock concert. Ha! Someone appreciates my puns. The Buck Wampum Historical Society would meet at one of the Ringing Rock sites annually, and on their third ever meeting, JJ Ott performed with his brass band a selection of songs. For reference of how piercingly loud some of these rocks can sound in person, an account at the time suggested that they could be clearly heard over JJ Ott's brass band, which is a testament to these rocks' ability to cut through a mix. Of course, all we have of that day are written accounts, as no recordings or photographs were taken. A 1919 paper from the Bucks County Historical Society describes these rocks as producing bell-like tones, and it does often feel like you're striking metal opposed to stone. But what kind of rocks are they? Well, they're made of something called diabase, which is an intrusive igneous rock with the same composition as basalt. Igneous, coming from the Latin word for fire, can be intrusive or extrusive. When you have intrusive igneous, like the one in this origin story, it means it formed from magma that solidified within the Earth's crust. During its formation, elements of olivine and pyroxene, common phenocrysts found within most of the planet's upper mantle, settled to the bottom of the magma and created an incredibly dense layer. This olivine diabase sill was then exposed to the surface by crustal uplift and erosion from the Ice Age. A process called frost wedging then occurred, where water froze within the sill's cracks and joints, and the pressure buildup broke the sill into boulders, which led to the creation of the field. Now that's nice and all, but you might be wondering, what is it that makes these rocks sing? So there's actually a little bit of controversy there. Because while there are multiple theories, there's actually not much testing that has been done to actually figure that out. This is Rockman Ethan, a geologist and an incredibly talented science communicator. If you haven't checked out his What's inside that rock series, definitely do so after the video. When I was looking up multiple sources uh, for the ringing rocks and trying to get like the best understanding of different scientific experiments that have been done, there's only been one scientific experiment. That experiment was conducted in the 1960s by a Rutgers professor who sought to open the rocks at the park in order to figure out what was going on. But before that, people theorized that it had to do with the iron content of the rocks. And you'd say, okay, well, let's do a chemical analysis of uh, the diabase rocks. And they found that it's, it's higher than most volcanic rocks. I think granite comes in around at uh, 3%. These diabase rocks came between 9% and 12% iron and they measured the ferric oxide composition of them. But compared to basalt, that's pretty standard. There's nothing extraordinary about that. It seems to be a pretty common assumption, speaking with locals and even consulting some articles on the matter, that the iron content of the rocks is what makes them ring. I guess it makes a kind of sense. When you strike the rocks, they do sound quite metallic. You can see how someone might intuit that they have an abnormally high iron content, but that's just not the case. So, 
If not that, then what else could it be? This Rutgers professor basically theora, had a theory involving live and dead rocks, which was kind of, it's kind of a crazy thing to think about a, a rock being alive or dead. He basically said that we're going to take rocks from different parts of the field. You have rocks from the outside of the field, uh, which he called dead rocks, and you had rocks from the inside of the field, which he called live rocks. And he sawed both of them open. And he noted that the dead rocks, when sawed, did not do anything. He was looking for changes in size, shape, anything that would be notable. But the rocks on the inside of the field actually expanded. And so this was interesting because, you know, why would a rock expand when it's cut open? You'd think it would just, you know, stay as itself. It, it could expand if it wanted as a normal rock. But then he theorized that because the rocks on the outside of the field were interacting with soil, tree shade, other things that would influence their weathering rate, that the weathering rate itself was the cause for a differing ringing ability, and that a slower weathering rate actually led to the rocks being able to ring. So it's the slow weathering rate that causes this mysterious ringing ability? But this doesn't actually capture the whole picture, because weathering only occurs on the tops of rocks as they're exposed to sunlight and weather conditions. If the bottom wasn't being weathered, you'd have an imbalance of stress within the rocks, which would seem to run counter to what we observe. If it was a, a slow weathering ability that did cause the ringing ability, then you'd have ringing rocks all over the world, in deserts, the Arctic, anywhere that rock is exposed, which isn't the case. So if that's not it, then what could the answer be here? What it likely is, is that he was very close because he was correct about stress. Stress is probably what caused the ringing rocks to have their ringing ability. Instead of the weathering being what caused it, it's likely when they were forming around two to three kilometers under the surface when they were first forming. That's a lot of depth. And at that depth, when you're in a mine, if you uh, suddenly unearth material in an in incorrect fashion, that can lead to explosive rock bursts. So you can just imagine the kind of stress that the rocks were under at this point. The thing is, though, that these rocks over millions of years were uplifted gradually. They weren't you know, broken off by extreme glaciers because they weren't completely covered. So instead, it took a very long time for them to be weathered. And this gradual weathering and not mechanical weathering is what led to the pressure slowly dissipating but not being completely gone. So this very specific gradual weathering and not mechanical weathering is what led to the pressure within the rocks to slowly dissipate to a sort of sweet spot, allowing them to ring. Or uh, at least that's the theory. This theory of relic stress understands the ringing rocks much like the string of a bass. When detuned and plucked, the string is loose and does not resonate enough to produce a recognizable tone. However, when tuned and under tension, you can pluck the string and hear an audible note. Likewise, a ringing rock boulder will only produce a dull thud if the boulder is de-stressed. However, boulders will resonate at various frequencies depending on the level of residual stress. Only about a third of these rocks are considered to be live rocks that ring. This was confirmed by acoustician Colin Warwick in 2020, who sampled an even distribution of 534 rocks across the park, of which only 167 of them actually rang. Putting the percentage of ringers around 31%, give or take a few, depending on how he defines live rocks. So that just shows you kind of like the, the crazy chances that had to be involved to get this perfect ringing ability. In a 1907 entry from Technical World Magazine, writer William C. Richardson describes the tones produced from these rocks as running upward from middle D on the piano. But in my experience, field recording here in the same spot nearly 115 years later, the rocks that show a lot of evidence of play rarely go as low as middle D. In fact, several frequency measurements from these rocks around the turn of the century seem to be quite a bit different in pitch than what I found on the prominently played rocks today. Granted, almost none of the rocks produce just a single tone. Instead, they're quite polyphonic with a single rock producing several tones, usually with little to no relation to each other. It's not like being able to hear different partials up the harmonic series from the incidental timbre of the one note. You're literally hearing 
multiple fundamentals, probably resulting from a combination of shape, position, internal tension, and size of each rock. Still, you can often discern a stronger fundamental with each rock, which is what I'm going to assume these old frequency charts were referring to. Could a hundred years of chipping away at the rocks have altered their tone? Maybe I'm not testing the exact same rocks that they were. Or have the rocks just changed in pitch from 1907? In purely geologic terms, erosion is a process in which earthly materials are worn away and moved by natural forces, like water or wind. Human intervention might not be considered in the truest, most scientific definition of the word. You probably couldn't call humanity's effects on the ringing rocks erosion, but for whatever reason, can't get that word out of my head. In Cumberland, that particular element comes into the realm of musical entertainment as well, for it was Captain Peter Crosswaite, an old retired merchant seaman who discovered music in stones. On such a road as this near Keswick, he accidentally struck a stone that gave forth sweet sounds, and this is the result. Utilizing rocks for their musical properties is by no means a novel practice. In fact, there's an entire instrument class devoted to them, lithophones. Litho meaning stone, and phone meaning sound. Some of the earliest instruments we know about are lithophones, like the ones from this Neolithic rock site discovered, forgotten, and then rediscovered again in Karnataka, India in 2004. Most surviving examples of early lithophones tend to be classified as rock gongs, which utilize the sonorous properties of the stones as they are, and are usually not altered with intention. Similar rock gongs can be found all across Africa, at sites in Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and Uganda. However, not all lithophones are rock gongs. Take the ancient Chinese Qing, which Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, are stone chimes, traditionally made of either resonant limestone or jade that has been shaped, tuned, and suspended in order to be played melodically. These chimes played a huge role in early Chinese dance music. This is the Vietnamese Dang Da. I'm almost certain I'm mispronouncing that one, but it's another example of a lithophone where the stone has been tuned, cut, and arranged, but instead of being suspended vertically like the Qing, it's organized horizontally on a raised platform, vaguely reminiscent of a xylophone or a marimba. Sometimes lithophones are used in religious contexts. On an island in Ethiopia's largest lake, Tana, rests a Coptic monastery, which uses a rock gong to replace a traditional bell that would be struck in Christian ceremonies. Other lithophones are just pure fun. Check out this postcard I found from 1906, which shows these comically overdressed outdoorsmen playing these stalagmites in the Luray Caverns of Virginia, which are famous for their reverberous properties, and this guy. Leland W. Sprinkle, who literally built an entire organ inside the caves, which play the stalactites and stalagmites mechanically, thereby turning the cave itself into the largest instrument in the world. Lithophones come in all shapes and sizes with a multitude of cultural and musical functions, from simple lithophone marimbas like this 
to this electromechanical lithophone MIDI robot that covers Wolfpack's It Gets Funkier 3. <laughs> I think my favorite lithophones, though, come from the late great Sardinian sculptor Pinuccio Sciola. Entrare dentro una pietra, ascoltarne il silenzio, credo che sia una emozione altrettanto forte come ascoltare i suoni delle pietre. È la musica del silenzio dentro la pietra, dentro il mondo, è quello che ci accompagnerà sempre. Shola crafted these gigantic, monolithic, geometric sculptures he called Pietre Sonore, which all sung in ways that you wouldn't think stones could sing. Panuccio had such an unparalleled talent for being able to draw out these ethereal sounds from the rocks. He redefined what lithophones could do and how they could sound. Fortunately for us, though, you don't need to be a master sculptor to have fun at the Ringing Rocks. Hello there. Would you like to bring the sounds of the Ringing Rocks into your home or studio? Well, now, for the small investment of $1 a month, you can. That's right, I'm finally launching my Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you'll have access to all my sample packs, including stems, loops, and behind the scenes materials. And other perks like early access to videos, extended cuts, your name in the credits, and hangout sessions where we can talk live about anything and everything music. Click the link in the description to support the channel. It really does help. I appreciate it. All right, enough selling. Let's get back to the video. JJ Ott would construct something very similar to the Vietnamese Don Da right here amidst the rock field. From the suggestion of local historian William J. Buck, rocks weighing around 200 pounds each were carefully selected from the rock field, tuned by chipping away at their surface and then arranged onto a horizontal pitch frame. We have record of at least two songs that Ott played that day, Home Sweet Home and uh, no, not the one by Montley Crue. <laughs> The 1823 operatic banger by John Payne. That side note was apparently so moving of a song, it was banned from being sung in Union camps in the Civil War for being too, quote, likely to incite desertion. And the second song, which is what I'm interested in, an original composition by Ott entitled Sounds from the Ringing Rocks. There is no recordings from that day, and as far as I can tell, Ott never wrote down any notation for his song. Now, curiously, there is an 1873 instrumental piano piece with the same name by composer B. Frank Walters. So maybe Ott was actually playing that song and and the historical society's accounts were incorrect? It's actually more possible than you might think. There are a bunch of articles that back up the claim that this song was indeed an original, but they all lead back to the same source and it doesn't seem like any independent sourcing has ever been done. But who knows, maybe he was just inspired by the title. It's been known to happen. For what it's worth, all accounts do back up the claim that Ott's Sounds from the Ringing Rocks is an original. Like I said, there are no recordings of that day, but I thought I might take a listen to B. Frank Walter's Sounds from the Ringing Rocks just to get a feel as to what could have been an inspiration for Ott's piece. But to my surprise, there are no recordings of B. Frank Walter's Sounds from the Ringing Rocks, at least none that I've been able to find. But I was just too darn curious about it, so I managed to track down the original sheet music. I don't actually play piano that well, so I asked my friend Webster to take a swing at what could possibly be the first ever recording of this hundred plus year old song. <laughs> Thank you. 
Gotta love those early American steamboat willy vibes. If I wanted to orchestrate this onto the rocks with a brass band, it might sound like this. But that's my spin on it, and likely quite a bit different than what Ott could have played that day. The fact of the matter is that we'll never actually know what John J. Ott's sounds from the Ringing Rocks actually sounded like. All accounts claim it to be an original, and there's no evidence to suggest that Mr. Ott borrowed anything than perhaps the name from B. Frank Walters. So it makes up forensic post-music theory analysis uh, nearly impossible. Sure, we could take the other song we knew for a fact he played that day, Home Sweet Home, and extrapolate maybe a key from some old sheet music and maybe find some common notes between that and sounds from the Ringing Rocks, but I, I don't know, that seems dubious. The stones that Mr. Ott tuned, bound, and played that day have since disappeared, presumably put back with the rest of the rocks, and will likely never be found amongst the rubble of Stony Garden. And even if we could reconstruct Mr. Ott's lithophone, it's been a long time since 1880. The park sees thousands of visitors every year, all that chipping away at the rocks may be altering their tones and pitch irrevocably. It bothers me that John J. Ott's Sounds from the Ringing Rocks is lost amongst this field of stone. It feels like a piece of history has disappeared beneath my feet. Like, I have all the puzzle pieces, but I don't know what I don't know, and so I don't have the capacity to understand how it all fits together. <laughs> This is Lascaux, a network of interconnected prehistoric caves discovered in southwestern France in 1940. And I know this seems like a random segue, but stick with me for a second, I promise it'll all come together. Lascaux was found by a band of teenagers, including 18-year-old mechanic Marcel Ravida and his dog named Robot. When taking a stroll through the French countryside, Marcel and Robot would stop to inspect a curious hole made by an uprooted tree. They would find that the hole led directly into a cave, and when they stumbled into the dark, they'd uncover possibly the greatest find in the history of prehistoric art. 2,000 prehistoric cave paintings perfectly preserved, which possibly date back as far as 20,000 years. This find was so significant that many call Lascaux the cradle of man's art, as did this 1952 film of the same name. Here on the walls of Lascaux, in paintings, signs, and dots, are perhaps the beginning of man's religion, his writing, his mathematics, and his art. Surely it was a day filled with magic, too, that revealed to these two French boys such a deep glimpse into mankind's distant past. Lascaux was well sealed, most likely due to a cave-in at the original entrance. So it's one of the only examples of prehistoric art perfectly preserved. Or it, at least it was. Lascaux opened to the public in 1948, with thousands of visitors every day shining lights across the walls and breathing inside the cave, air quality went down and the paintings started to deteriorate. Mold and fungi started to develop on the walls and the art that was once so vibrant started to fade and lose its clarity. Author and YouTuber John Green once wrote about the caves and on the effects modern humans have on that of ancient humans that sometimes just the act of looking at something can ruin it. In just 15 years, by our mere presence, we destroyed the art more quickly than in the past 15,000 years before that. Lascaux closed to the public in 1963. Efforts to preserve the cave are ongoing. Will we ever actually know what John J. Ott's Sounds from the Ringing Rocks actually sounded like? No. 
Have the rocks changed in pitch since 1880 due to humans being human? Yeah, probably. Should we like Lascaux in order to preserve that which is beautiful, stop going to the rocks? No. Humans have a tendency to leave our mark wherever we trample. I phrase it like that because it feels wrong to just say that we make things worse or that we are the destroyer of beautiful things. We do destroy, don't get me wrong, we do so in furtherance of humanity and of self-interest, and those are not good things. But we also create beauty and curiosity and legacy. We have a direct connection through Lascaux to our ancestors who came 15, maybe 20,000 years before us because of what they chose to leave behind. Through their art, they showed us what occupied their hearts and minds. Their concerns, in some ways, were very different from ours, and we can learn. And in some ways, their concerns are still our concerns, so we can empathize. One of the most stunning things left behind in Lascaux is also the most human. Negative hand stencils made by blowing ochre, a mixture of iron oxide and sand, through the fingers to give a lasting impression of us. To me, it's their way of saying, we were here. In a universe so vast, in a world so dangerous, we existed and we mattered. The cave paintings are there because the people who left them dared to leave their mark. With every blow from our hammer, the sound undoubtedly changes in some small way. But fortunately for the case of the ringing rocks, unlike that of Lascaux, stone is much more resilient than paint. Just ask that guy on TikTok who's made it his mission to kick a rock every single day until it turns into a sphere. Stone is not so easily eroded even by human hands. The ringing rocks have been here long before us, and they will continue to be here after we are gone. What remains is what we put into them. The more we touch, the more we create, and the more we human, the further we get from John J. Ott's sounds from the ringing rocks. And that's something to be missed, but it's also beautiful. Ott had his time, he had his song, and maybe in a weird, nebulous way, when we play, we're connecting to that, and playing with him, adding to the song that has been playing at the Ringing Rocks all this time. When the sculptor Panucha Shola was asked about his work and his connection with the stones, this is what he had to say. La pietra è quel, quella struttura portante di questo pianeta. È la espina dorsale del mundo, come dicevano ancora los Incas. La pietra oggi è la memoria dell'universo. Shola believed in the beauty that existed between the collaboration between stone and man. He would often talk about opening up rocks just enough to allow them to sing and to tell their story. He knew better than anyone else that what we find when we play the stones is ourselves reflected into the rocks we carve. When I was on location for this video in Pennsylvania, I stumbled across this charming, slightly rundown antique store and I found these postcards of the Ringing Rocks. They've already been well loved. This one is from 1908. It reads, Dear Little Ruth, remember, you were here from your grandmother. I wanted to compose something at the Ringing Rocks which encapsulated some of these thoughts I've been sharing with you. This is what I came up with. The music is set for eight players. Each performer will play the same consistent half note rhythm on their individual rock. Using a compositional technique called phasing, each player will be offset from their neighbor and displaced by one sixteenth note. This way we fill a perfect 16 note grid rhythmically. Each musician, or because I'm running an extremely low budget production here, each Levi will theoretically draw straws, or maybe more aptly, pick rocks, and allow the order to organize when each Levi, or each musician, will cut out in the music and stop playing. As each Levi drops out, a new composite rhythm will appear to the listener until the last Levi drops out and we are left with nothing but a stark silence. Every time you perform this piece, so long as you're drawing different straws or rocks or what have you, it'll sound different. 
You'll hear new sequences, new rhythms, and you'll never hear the same piece in the same way twice. This piece is called erosion.